My guest tonight is Andrea Johnson, who is the head of the Investigating Directorate, which was promulgated in 2019 by President Cyril Ramaphosa. Thank you so much for joining us. Andrea, may I call you Andrea? You're more than welcome and thank you for having me. I remember you from the Oscar Pistorius trial days and you never courted the media. In fact, you used to run away from us, <laughs> which I don't blame you in the slightest. And, and here you are in the spotlight at the very center of trying to find people responsible for state capture and, and prosecute them successfully. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm actually quite well. Um, I'm in a position where I can make a difference. I'm sure after recent happenings, which you'll probably go into some detail on, people would like me to leave office. Where I am currently, I'm really satisfied that I'm in the right place doing the right thing. And so when I used to run away from you guys in the Pistorius mat, it wasn't intentional, by the way. <laughs> I'm actually quite loud when I'm in court. Um, I'm quite loud if I'm in a meeting. But when I'm out of that professional setting, I'm very private. But this job does put you in the spotlight, unwittingly so. I serve the public. I serve the republic. And so people cannot have me shy away from the spotlight. I don't know how you could have been louder than Gerinel at the time, but it's refreshing for somebody to say they serve the Republic because the chime that we are hearing again and again is that we serve the party. And that's very disappointing and disturbing as, as a South African. If I could just give context. Um, growing up as a young black female in apartheid South Africa, my late dad was a policeman. They were not allowed any political affiliations. I did not know politics. I stayed away from politics. And I've loved people my whole entire life. And so when I started prosecuting, that's all I did. It was understanding that we were lawyers for the people, what the people needed. And so regardless of the different roles and ranks I've had and occupied in the NPA, it just was a transition from role to role. But the oath and my ability to understand what my true calling was has never changed. So I have not had any need to be in a political space. I've not had any need to um, defer to what is the going at the time. What's the flavor of the day? What do politicians want? They don't play a role in my life. They've never played a role in my life. And the people who play a role are the people of the Republic. That's what determines what I do, how I do it, why I do it. That's what sets me apart. And I'm able to say unequivocally so, I am the servant of the Republic. Let's talk about the Guptas, the latest extradition request denied by the UAE. Were mistakes made? By the NPA? By the DOJ? No. And so I can say that unequivocally for the following reasons. We knew that this is an important matter, the extradition of the Guptas. We also had outside counsel on appointment assisting us in the matters. We drafted our legal papers. And we realized it would actually be collegial to reach out to our UAE counterparts, just to find out if we had you know, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. And so we sent over a team of investigators and prosecutors and an extradition expert that was in the NPA through to the UAE. And they met with the judge, um, uh, the judge who knows what is required in terms of their central authority. Judge went through all our papers um, and the judge indicated where we needed to tweak things, make a change here and there. There were suggestions about maybe the amendment of a charge or two. The team came back. We made the necessary amendments according to the suggestions. And we sent our papers off. They were sent through the central authority, which is DOJ, all on time. We engaged with the UAE. They take very long in between engagements. They're not forthcoming on their own unless you prompt. Um, where are we? What is going on? Uh, what do we need to do? Our papers in order. We've done all of that. We hadn't heard from them about anything being amiss. I think perhaps a month or six weeks after the papers were filed, they asked me to authenticate the Arabic version. I'm Andrea Johnson, fully functional in English. I do not read, write, nor speak Arabic. 
I couldn't understand the purpose of the request. I, however, did put in a statement that said, I don't read, write, nor speak Arabic. I, however, do believe that the translation is correct. That was all they asked. Never asked us anything again. There were no other engagements. And we tried to follow up to find out what was taking so long. In fact, we did see them in Morocco um, for the FATF. They were there, I think, to give their feedback on their six-month action plan because they are grey-listed, or their one-year action plan. This is They'd, the UAE. The UAE. They didn't engage us at all. And so we were blindsided when we got the response. I know a lot of people had a lot of questions about the warrants, and if I could just get that out of the way. When the team went to, to the UAE, the UAE indicated that they don't deal with exchange control contraventions, and therefore advised that we it would be best to remove that contravention. You can't extradite on a crime that's that not a crime in the non-requesting state. Yes. So the initial warrants captured all of the charges. The exchange control regulations would have been one of them. So when we came back and we made the necessary amendments, not just to the papers but to the indictment, we had to get new warrants of arrest, leaving out the exchange control regulations, etc. And so when we sent our papers, we sent the cancelled warrant to show that we had done what was requested and that the new warrants, in fact, captured the charges as per the new indictment, as per the discussions. Nothing was raised. So we were taken aback when the excuse, because I have no other word, when the excuse of a technicality over the warrants was raised. So we're waiting to get full feedback on what that technicality meant. We still don't have feedback, but we did everything we were supposed to, both the NPA and the DOJ. Did any of your team, when they went to Dubai, see the Guptas incarcerated? Nobody I've spoken to has ever seen the Guptas in any kind of compound, in any kind of space where their freedom of movement was limited? I do know that the investigators asked if they could see um, where they were and they were not allowed access to the Guptas. So not the investigation or the prosecution team were allowed to engage or to see where they were. So we work on good faith. The UAE said that they were incarcerated. And since we have nothing to prove the opposite, um, that's what we believe. They were incarcerated but we didn't see them. There is a chance, though, I suppose, that they were never. I guess that your guess is as good as mine, and that guess is as good as many around the world. And I don't know if we'll ever truly know where they were incarcerated and if they were incarcerated. I'll use the word bad faith so that you don't have to. But the fact that you were the Department of Justice was only notified in a note for Bal by the UAE several weeks later that the extradition request had been denied certainly seems in bad faith and very strange. Without an explanation to the contrary, yes. Um, and because we all know that these matters are time sensitive as does the UAE. And so timelessly informing us would have been uh, the best thing to do, which wasn't the case. And so one has to wonder why not. Um, and I guess we left wondering because there was no engagement. I would have expected and appreciated if they reached out to say, I'm sorry, your papers are not in order and this is what is wrong with it. And if you don't uh, fix it within 48 hours, well, the die is cast, nothing. So one, their decision is, is really mind-boggling, but even more confounding to that issue is why were we not told in time? The UAE president and the prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Negan, is currently in South Africa having a wonderful holiday here in the Eastern Cape on, on, on a game farm. Have you reached out at all uh, to the president or the prince and asked for some kind of audience, not the NPA specifically, but perhaps the Department of Justice or other diplomatic arm? Yes, I did read that in the media articles. Um, somewhat surprised. <laughs>
I mean, I would I think, think South Africa would be really slighted and rather annoyed diplomatically than to allow them to use their own private runway and have a wonderful holiday here. I take the point. Uh, and so I'm not privy if anyone in the Department of Justice or the presidency reached out to them. The NPA was not asked for a view on that possibility. So whether or not that happened, unfortunately, the NPA is unable to comment. Um, should they have? I don't know how these diplomatic things work. The prosecutor in me, pretty please. I would have loved them to use uh, this opportunity because we all need the answers. Do you feel that you're in a catch-22 in a way because the iceberg of corruption is growing higher and higher? There's more and more pressure from the public that those who have been involved are prosecuted and do not escape with impunity, which seems to have been happening for a very long time. And yet the politicians cannot be happy with the implication of their own in-state capture. I think we'd be living under a rock uh, if one thought that they do not feel some kind of way. I'm not in the feelings game, at, lo at least not in the political feelings game. I'm in the game of understanding what the facts and the law are. And I'm directed exactly by the facts and the law. What is it that I must look at? And if the facts and the law take me to a particular individual, it's not about their political affiliation. It is about their role in criminality. Can I address it? Do I have enough to address it? And then I will address it. Am I naive to think that I'm going to face some kind of backlash? No, it will come. I think South Africa has shown over the years, especially with the rampant corruption that we have, they do come for the do-gooders. They do come for those who want to address criminality and corruption. Am I scared? No. Am I cautious? Yes. But cautious insofar as my own safety is concerned, but not insofar as who I deal with and how I deal with them. Are you threatened at all? No. Maybe I should be worried about not being threatened. Maybe I should be worried about the fact that I'm not scared. But I think after a little over 26 years of being a prosecutor and a career prosecutor, um, my last actual stint in court was October 2021. So I've been at it for a long time. I know what comes with the job. So when I say I should be cautious, it means I shouldn't be blindly walking into something, but I should be fully informed. And that is what I do. I do worry about my family, obviously because as we've seen, whether it was whistleblowers or do-gooders, uh, people's lives and the lives of their families have been placed in jeopardy. I'm cautious only in so far as that is concerned. But I'm not cautious in how I do my work because I have to do my work. There's a job to be done. Um, I think the question is if I'm not gonna do it now, so who do they put in my place? And will somebody else be able to do what I know I can do, given the opportunity, given the resources, um, and given the powers that I need? And I'm saying unequivocally so. I am good for it right here, right now. That's what matters. You are not an investigations-led prosecutions team, such as the Scorpions. You have to rely on other agencies, such as the Hawks, such as the SAPS, etc., to give you that docket Am I right? Yes, in the traditional matters. So the investigating directorate are not the Scorpions. We are not the Scorpions 2.0. We are the investigating directorate who are going to deal with corruption with a different mandate, a different set of powers, and we have to have a different approach. So in the investigating directorate, we do work on a prosecution led. So we are prosecutors criminal and financial investigators, uh, data capturers, data analysts, project managers. And so we have a multifaceted team, which means that going forward, prosecutors lead the matters. They give direction to the investigations. And here's the big but, and I think this is hugely problematic and perhaps what many South Africans don't understand is that you were set up as a temporary agency that still has to be made permanent, and you don't have the sufficient investigating powers that you should have yet in order to be prosecutions led. You don't have forensic teams, you don't, you are, are really reliant on the hawks and, and what SAPS gives you to a large extent. And then you've got to look at that and say, 
I don't have enough here to prosecute for a winnable case, or I do. But you still have yet to get that power that you need. Exactly. You're right on the money. We are not yet permanent. We don't have powers. Didn't stop us from working, by the way. And I think last year we did show the results. Because what we did is we adopted the methodology I just described, that multifaceted approach where you look at resource investigation and prosecution, plans and strategies. What we do need are our powers. We need powers in terms of Section 30 of the NPA Act, which will capacitate both criminal and financial investigators in my space. We need our permanence because the permanence means it's not just about security of tenure. It allows people the ability to work without fear, favor or prejudice because they know they're good to go. They have the backing of the legislation, not the womb of a person, not the womb of a party. Where we are currently, it is a disadvantage. I have duty reassigned investigators, colloquially they called seconded officials. I have only 15. There's 202 criminal recommendations in Zondo. I have 15. These 15 come from the DPCI and some from IPED. They are on loan. It is not the best case scenario. When people are on loan, you are mindful they are not yours. You are also mindful that they don't necessarily have that 100% buy-in into what you want to do. Why? They know they're not permanent. Why must they give this new space their 100%? A lot of the times, through human default, they err on the side of caution and defer to what they know. They go back to how they operated, where they operated, but with my mandate and our methodology. Some things fall through the cracks in the sense of where what the ID ideally wants to do is use its Section 28 powers of subpoena of questioning, of interrogating. It's Section 30 investigative powers for the investigators to be fully fledged and independent. We don't have that. These are complex crimes. If you look at the architecture of state capture itself, it was done in a very creative, systemic way and you know that you need forensic investigators who be able to trawl through hours files and bundles and bundles of paperwork who's doing that for you at the moment that's exactly that capacity that i've indicated what we do need is digital forensics we don't just need people we need the right databases we need the systems and the hardware the software we need people who know how to take volumes of data give them direction and have them come up with an analytical document from which the investigators can take an investigation forward. And so I guess for me it's a matter of when the ID was conceptualized, I think much more thought should have been given to what will this animal need to be fully functional? Because what we know we can do, we cannot do because we are not fully functional. And so for me, politics aside, I would like government to say, what does the ID need? So the president, in his wisdom, said so. He said, late in October 2022, the ID should be permanent. It means speedily making amendments to the legislation, which we are still waiting for. Herein lies the rub. Is there the political will to make sure that you are a fully functioning, super resourced, machine which can prosecute successfully? I do believe there's goodwill, but the goodwill has to act faster than what it has acted. I'm currently in a, at a disadvantaged position because the president made his announcement in October. We're almost at the end of April. And so whilst I will not and don't delve into the political mind, what I will delve into is does it have to take so long? We are set back with every day that goes forward without having the powers that we require and the permanence. Because for 
the idea to be truly effective, that is what I need. It is the broken record that's going to continue and continue. The longer it takes us to capacitate ourselves to deal with the volumes of information that are out there, that sit at Zondo, that sit everywhere else, that must be assessed, correctly so, and brought into the investigative and the prosecution realm. It means that when I'm ready to start, it's almost like I've got to work back a year. But why is it taking so long to, on a legislative level to get you those powers that you need? The truth be told, I'm not sure. We had engaged with the Department of Justice. So we made the proposals. They've got to legislate those proposals. They are responsible for the drafts. They are responsible for getting it through cabinet. They are responsible for putting it before parliament. And so the process is with the Department of Justice. I think if I have to venture a guess, <laughs> Uh, and cheekily so, I think it's, it's a matter of fully understanding what this ID must be. I think there might be still a bit of trepidation that we are waiting for the return of the scorpions. Why they not? They unknown. did a brilliant job. So whilst they did a brilliant job, they also made a few brilliant mistakes, as was evidence in some of the judgments. And so what we are premising who we need to be is based on what the Glenister judgments say, what the freedom under law judgments say, what good sense tells us. And so there's no return of the scorpions. It is a brand spanking new investigative directorate that will deal with corruption at the highest level. And I think once we shoot down that myth of the scorpions returning, I think there'd be just a bit more impetus. One may say, why can you not ask for investigative powers in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act? What's so special about you getting investigative powers in terms of Section 30 of the National Prosecuting Authority Act? It means when it is legislated, it cannot be withdrawn at the whim of someone. If we have criminal procedure, investigative powers. These powers are conferred on us by the Minister of Police, by the Minister of Justice. We cannot afford to be the flavor of a month and hope to God that the powers are not withdrawn. That is the import of the Glenister judgment. It really talks to true independence and to true functionality, which is all we want. You have a reputation as being a good case strategist by your colleagues that you are a proactive rather than a reactive prosecutor. And then we have New Lane. The people involved were acquitted and it had a direct link to a possible success in the reapplication of an extradition request. The judge who was hearing it said, the audacious manner in which this matter was investigated is truly to be lamented. I'm going to have to put you in the pickle here because A, you inherited that case, but you could have withdrawn it. Mm -hmm. B, you had to rely on other organizations to provide you with enough evidence to win that case. And those other agencies are, for instance, the Hawks. What do you do? When I took over at the ID, it's no great secret that it wasn't going well at the time. When I stepped in, I couldn't, as my first act of business, say, well, here I am. I'm a good case strategist. I'm a great operator. So I'm going to throw out everything that was done before me. I had to, day by day, deal with what wasn't there, what needed to be there, and also still deal with those matters that had already been enrolled. Nulane was one of them. I had no reason to believe at the time that my predecessor and the team that engaged her, sat with her, had arrived at the incorrect decision. So apart from that matter, there wasn't any other matter that I had to reconsider. So I had no reason to say, well, let me review all of these matters. And I think there the judge was rather scathing. The judge was very open about all of the misgivings she had about how the investigation was conducted. And here I have to pause. The investigators are from the DPCI. They are duty reassigned to the ID. The Nulane and the um, Estina matters are very tied together. These matters started in 2017. Much of it happened in the space of the Hawks before they came over to the investigating directorate. 
So you have an investigative capacity that worked in the traditional way, being brought into this new entity that should actually have been prosecution-led. But where I would ask you for, for a frank answer is, it was clear that it wasn't well investigated. And at what point could you have said, we're withdrawing? Much of what came out, came out during the trial. There was nothing before that. That's, that's the God, God's honest truth. Wouldn't you have seen the, the docket and, you know, you would have seen all the bundles? So, and... when the prosecutors were preparing for court, we did have engagements. They didn't have any concerns, neither did I, because it was the same team that had been dealing with the matter from the time my predecessor had been there. And that's why I say I didn't have any cause to reconsider the matter. There wasn't anything glaring. It's only as the trial started that one realised, oops, we do have a challenge and we do have investigative shortcomings because when the evidence was led, when the investigator was led, it became clear that not everything was explained as, as openly and as frankly to the prosecutors uh, for whatever reason and that where they perhaps would have been able to engage and say, ID, we do have a problem. One, two and three are actual shortcomings. Of course, I would have had no qualm about withdrawing the matter because when it comes to the extradition, we still had the Astina matter on which the extradition was based. In any event, if we look at the timeline, I think the New Lane trial had started, but the decision by the UAE had already been made about the extradition. So it didn't play a role there, but I would have had no qualms if I knew um, about the alleged glaring shortcomings in the investigation. Is there any point with New Lane, everyone acquitted and the extradition request, request being denied on appealing? The extradition request is not just on the New Lane matter. There is the Estina matter and that will continue. Uh, what we are doing is reviewing all the matters uh, because what the ID cannot do is be taking matters to court and then there are questions about Shoddiness, that's what Judge said, shoddy investigations. We cannot be shoddy investigators, so all matters are being reviewed. You know, when it comes to how we're going to go forward and how we're going to deal with matters, I don't think that we've always learned to introspect about matters. So we're going to look at the appeal, but first we look at the judgment. If there are challenges with how the prosecution conducted themselves, it will be dealt with. If there are challenges about the legitimacy um, of the investigation, it has to be dealt with, also with the head of the Hawks. And if the judge erred and misdirected herself, the ID will have to consider its appeal process. But it's a process, Annika, that we've got to consider unemotionally. Everyone's emotional about the matter. They've the country is in an uproar. Country is in an uproar. And we yeah. cannot react to it emotionally. So what we have to consider is, where will an appeal take us? Are there questions of law on which we want to appeal? Will it change the status quo? Do we run the risk of getting another scathing judgment in the Court of Appeal? So those are all the considerations currently underway. Um, we haven't made up our minds yet, but I think more importantly for me right now as the investigating director is, what went wrong in our space, in the investigation and prosecution space? Um, and I've got to deal with that. It was the case that triggered the red notice for, for Interpol. Does that red notice still stand currently for two of the Gupta brothers? Yes, they do. The, the red notices are still valid. We did engage with Interpol as well, and we've got the assurance that those red notices remain active. I'm not sure how the red notice will work in terms of the no lane matter, but the red notices are valid for both the brothers in terms of the Estina matter. But how can they travel then to Switzerland, Vanuatu? I don't understand. Neither do we. And I think the, the challenge is, I think we forget they, may, they have had more than one passport. They don't only have South African passports. Let us stop guessing they only traveled on South African passports. They have Indian passports. 
They could have gone anywhere in the world with those Indian passports. And they may have been traveling for quite a bit before the Sounds decision like to not extradite was communicated to South Africa. We're none the wiser. One would have to now go back and look into those travel records. But I think the fact that they have the money to do so and they have more than one passport says they can travel. I think what pains me is countries that are party to the red notices, countries that buy into the extradition process, you would expect more. You would expect that because these red notices were circulated, whether they traveled on an Indian passport or a South African passport, Tony Gupta is Tony Gupta, regardless of which passport, the red notices should have been triggered in the different countries other than the UAE, if they did in fact travel in the times we think they traveled. Do you not feel somewhat defeated having to deal with a country who has not behaved in a manner that I would say is collegial? I'm not defeated, I'm disappointed. We've got work to do and we're gonna to have to get to it. And so if we cannot get the Guptas through the UAE on the remaining matter that we have, we have our aid notices, they are still in circulation. We continue with the rest of our matters. I think I'd just like to correct something. It, it, it is so. The Nulain matter was one of the smallest matters on which the red notices could have gone out. They went out way before my time, but we needed to act upon them once the, the Guptas were arrested. But I think the truth is, and everyone's waiting for it, there are more matters, bigger matters, than the Estina and the New Lane. And so we've got to make sure that those matters are all getting ready, as they are, by the way, so that when we submit our extradition papers to whichever country we do, we submit more than just the smaller matters that we had. You've enrolled 26 cases, declared 89 investigations, and 165 accused have appeared in court for alleged state capture offences. So there are loads more cases that are still sitting on your table, not just the Guptas. Are any of those involving high-level politicians that you feel could cause their prosecution, cause a lot of disruption in the country? I think we'd be naive if I'm going to say, oh no, we don't have matters involving anyone that's high level or high level politicians. I think we know what Zondo's report came out saying, and that's what we're looking at. I'd like to believe that they'd be smart enough to let us be as law enforcement. Are they going to? <laughs> I don't think so. I think history has shown that there are influences and indirect interference. I'll have to cross that bridge when we get there, but we have to carry on investigating. I think it would be an even bigger travesty after having the Zondo Commission run for as long as it has, with the amount of money we've expended, with the amount of knowledge and evidence we've gleaned, to stop and falter and say, well, I don't think we'll go after that one right now you know, because it's the elections in 2024. That's not what governs what we do in the ID space. Which has happened before with other NDPPs. The current NDPP allows me, the current ID, and I can only speak for my space. And we're talking about Shamila Batoy. Shamila Batoy allows me, Andrea Johnson, as the investigating director, the independence to work. She does not dictate which cases I take. She doesn't have a right to, by the way, and she understands that very, very well. She understands very well I do not take instructions. I take advice. I will hear you, but I will do my work because my oath is not to Shamila Batoy. My oath is to self and country. To date, I have had no issues with the current national director or with the current executive of the NPA. They have been extremely supportive. So interference internally, absolutely not worried. Do I think that some or other politician might wake up one fine day, not too far from today and say, oh, we've got to get that little girl. Where does she think she's getting to with these matters? Real likelihood. Will I stop? No. Do I have faith in my staff? Yes. And can we change the tide from the Nulain matter? I have no doubt. 
we all fall, we all fail. I think what people should watch is, what does the ID do after this matter? One of the criticisms that I have heard from members of the bar is that you work in silos and there are so many cases that actually are interlinked. Is this true? So that might have been the case before. So we don't have sectors anymore from the time I took up office. What we've done is we've pulled together those matters that are interlinked. I couldn't understand how you had an entity to deal with state capture, but there wasn't a state capture case. I don't know if I make sense. There's state capture, state capture, and then there's the aftermath of the state capture, which is procurement gone wrong. We need to show how people, politically or otherwise, people in government, people in SOEs, were brought in that were not in a specific SOE or space. The timing thereof is important. The who was brought in is important. Why they were brought in is important. And what they managed to achieve. And then they moved on. The we, revolving boards. And we cannot lose sight of that. And that is where we are. We, we started in the middle of last year with such a matter. It will take some time because it is the true principle behind state capture. Quite a few people that we've interviewed who are in positions of power, they, they lock up their coffee, tea in the evening. They make sure that their milk is not contaminated with. Do you operate on a similar level, a similar level here at the ID? What I do... Are you scared of being poisoned, in other words? It's a reality we have to face. What I make sure of is that the staff are very aware. Uh, they've got to be aware of their surroundings. They've got to be aware of the company they keep. They have to be aware of what they talk about and where they talk about it. Document and data security is key. When it comes to myself, I thank the good Lord I'm as fussy as I am. I make my own coffee at home, at work. But am um, I realistic that there are other ways, as they have with Babita Diokaran, for example? Of course. I can only do so much in terms of taking care of myself without being so paranoid. I become paralyzed. And so the paranoia that will lead to paralysis is what will make those who are corrupt win. I can't do that. Do you have the support of the president? The president signed my appointment. Zuma established the Zondo Commission. The president looked at our work and decided we are permanent. I don't know if he has, I have his support. I've never spoken to him. What I care about is, what do the South African people, my people, the people I'm supposed to serve, think about me? I've been listening to all the sounds when it came to Nulane, for example. I hear what gets said. I listen to the issues about the extradition. So whether the president or anyone else in politics likes me, doesn't like me, is out to get me, don't know, don't care. It may sound rather flippant, but I really don't know, and I really don't care. What I do care about is that, that I be left alone, as the NDPP has and the exco of the NPA has, be left alone to do my work to the best of my ability, to lead my staff in the best way I know how. I love this job. There's no president that's now going to make me not want my job. It's going to be a right royal battle if that happens. I will not go down quietly into the night, not at all. So I'm going to do my work. Like I said uh, in an interview sometime last year, I was also asked how I feel about my safety. I've got to do my job, and I expect South Africans who want me to do my job to rally around behind me. When my life is in danger, I'd like them to rise up and take the call and say, if you fight this fight that we want you to fight against corruption, we've got your back girl any day of the week, whichever way they choose to have my back. I just want to do my job. I just want my staff to be allowed to do their job. But tongue in cheek, may I say, I want my powers and permanence, please, because that is going to tip in my favor how we get to execute our mandate. Who approached you to do the job and what was that process? I was approached by the national director who asked if I would consider the post. Um, I had to think about it long and hard, by the way. 
It wouldn't seem like it now. But have really you those ponderous phone calls where you thought, oh my lord, do I have to take I have to take this country duty or can I actually carry on doing what I've been doing all these years? Well, where I was at the time, I was the national coordinator of organized crime. That in itself is not an easy chair, uh, given where we are with organized crime. The only consideration was when Harry and I did the Celebi matter, my family suffered quite a lot. My husband suffered in terms of work and the victimization. So one had to ask, the only question I had was not about my oath, was not about my ability. It was what would I put my family through? And so having discussed it with them, um, I was happy when they said, we've got your back. We know you want to do this, so please go ahead and do it. That was the only consideration I had. You know what I did want to ask you, and not formally, but informally, but what do your family think of you, if I were to ask them? My daughter would tell you that I was extremely bossy and I'm sort of now getting with the program, now that she's 25, and really understanding motherhood, and stopped interrogating her like I used to when she was younger, and she would tell me, you are not in court, <laughs> and I'm not your accused. So what I love about myself is, how I am here is how I am at home, in terms of my straightforwardness. It makes it so easy. I don't have a different hat to put on, and I absolutely love being a wife. Uh, I have been a wife for over 20 years, of course, and a mum for 25. What does being a wife mean? I think the intricacies of my life are, are, are somewhat challenging. I'm Indian married to a coloured male. I'm Christian and he's Muslim. And we have a daughter who's decided to follow the Tamil religion. I mean, talk about a religious calendar going bang from the 1st of Jan till the 31st of December. We're really very multifaceted. And I think it's that diversity that I have in my personal life that makes me different in my professional life. I'm able to see things not through one lens. I've, I've been exposed to all kinds of things because of our different races and our religion and, and, and that cultural diversity that it all brings. So as a wife, I, oh God, I think I tried to listen. I know I failed quite a lot, a lot of times, but I, I'm very family orientated. I love cooking. I can cook up a storm. That brings us together a lot of the time because, you know, they're in the lounge, uh, I'm cooking in the kitchen and we're all chatting and we sit over a meal. And you speak an ind indigenous language? I speak fluent English, Afrikaans and Zulu. I understand Kosa. I'm getting a neck of the, 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 the Tswana. I love to tell people that the first thing I learned, learned to read as a young girl growing up in rural KZN was trespassers will be prosecuted because I could never understand these lots of places that had these signs with the dog. But then there was the one language I could read and the other one I couldn't read. And so I learned to read it. The first ever Zulu thing I learned to read was Abahamba Negentlele by Yoboshua. Those who trespass will be prosecuted. You have the passion, you have the drive, you have the dedication and huge amounts of experience. I wish you the biggest fangs <laughs> the longest teeth that you may wish for. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.